So this is poker, right? Aces are good. Two pair beats one pair. A flush beats a straight. You show me your cards and I'll show you mine. Simple, right? Wrong. Because poker is a game played in the mind as much as on the felt. And as a poker player, one of the most powerful weapons you can hope to have, that you need to have, is the bluff. There's no right or wrong way to play poker. There's not one method that will guarantee success. But there are ways and means for you to maximize your chances of winning. There are good habits and bad habits. There are situations to avoid and situations to seek. And there are those who have the knowledge to exploit them. We're going to teach you how to master the game. From the basics to the advanced. shows down then and while we might not have covered everything you wanted to know about poker we have covered the mechanics the value of starting hands and position time for a bit of fun now in this show we're going to look at bluffing two tutorials for you today that cover yes bluffing and the continuation deck this show features poker from all over the planet but today the action takes us to Las Vegas and South America and we open the vault to replay some classic and creative poker moves from the Bahamas. We stay in the Bahamas as four poker heavyweights talk tactics. Pagano, Russo, Bari, and Moneymaker discuss the art of bluffing. While analysis comes courtesy of 2005 World Series of Poker champion Joe Hashem. Plus, Nacho Barbera reveals the secrets of his success as he relives his back-to-back triumphs on the Latin America poker tour. That's all to come, but first, your tutorial. Bluffing is an integral part of the game of poker. In its simplest form, a bluff is a bet or raise with a hand which is not thought to be the best hand. It's what makes the game so interesting. Does your opponent really have a big hand, or are they just pulling off a big bluff? Here are the most important reasons to bluff. To win pots you would have lost otherwise. To make your opponents wonder if you really have it. And to put pressure on your opponents. The first reason to bluff is both very obvious and very important. Bluffing allows you to win pots even if you have a weak hand that would have otherwise lost. There is. It's pretty hard to make a good hand and hold them. If you always fold your hand when you don't hit anything, your opponents will pick up a lot more pots than you do. The second reason is important for when you actually do have a very good hand. If you never bluff, everyone will know when you have something if you better raise. I just see your soul. When you have pocket aces, you don't want everyone to fold, do you? The third reason to bluff is to put a lot of pressure on your opponents. Some of them will crumble and be very intimidated. They will react passively and will fold a lot of better hands. Other players might get upset, play badly, and throw away their chips. Now that you know why to bluff, we're going to show you how to bluff. Look for signs of weakness and attack. Don't bluff if there are too many other players. Bluff to represent a hand. Play it as you have it. If your opponent is weak, it's much easier to bluff them off the hand. Therefore, you should look for signs of weakness and attack if you spot them. You should also try to bluff if you only have one opponent for this simple reason. The more opponents you have, the more likely it is that at least one of them has a good hand. The last way to bluff is to represent a hand. Let's take a look at an example. Here you've got king-queen and have called an under-the-gun pre-flop raise, so you can assume that your opponent has a strong hand. The flop is seven jack-10 with two diamonds to give you an open-ended straight draw. Your opponent bets and you call. The turn is the four of clubs. They bet and you call again. The river is the six of diamonds. You've missed your straight draw, but the river has brought all kinds of straight and flush possibilities to the table. Your opponent bets again. Now's your opportunity. It's extremely unlikely that your opponent has a straight or a flush as they have bet throughout the hand. They probably have a high pocket pair or maybe a set. Now you make a big re-raise and unless they have a strong read on you, they can't continue. You've represented the flush or straight and you can win a nice big pop. Now you know why you bluff and how to bluff. 
the three reasons why, to win pots you would have otherwise lost, to keep your opponents guessing, and to put pressure on your opponents. How to bluff? Oh, look for signs of weakness and attack, avoid bluffing against too many players, and represent a hand. Follow these rules and your bluffs will be successful. Hopefully. Before we go any further, here is more of your all-important poker lingo. Never call me. Don't play with me. You can't show aces every hand. Because when I raise the kings, you'll know I'm weak. You're on the flush draw. Trap them. Just snap me off on Jack High. Last time. It's terminology time. Tilt. When a player tilts, they're letting their emotions control the way they're playing. A player on tilt is likely to play more pots, more aggressively, and other players often take advantage of this. You on tilt? <laughs> yes, <laughs> To never go on tilt is considered to be an important part of being a professional poker player. Fish. A fish is basically the name given to a bad player, the kind of player you like to have on your table. I do it to a fish, not to a genuine player, you know? Sick. In poker, the term sick can have positive and negative connotations. It basically translates as unbelievable. That's the sickest thing ever. For example, the outcome of this hand is sick. Everyone close their eyes, I can't pass. Oh! We're gonna lose him. A 5% chance. Oh no, hello. It's not gonna happen. A 5 or a 10, no, that's why they are a 5 or... It's the 10 for the street! And Rafferty can't believe his luck! But on the other hand, if a player is on a sick run, it means they can't stop winning. Or if they make a sick call, it's an amazing call. Float. Floating is when a player decides to call an opponent's bet with no made hand of their own. Simply to set up a bluff later on in the hand, like this player who calls his opponent's bet with jack six. No pair, no draw. Then later in the hand, when his opponent shows weakness, he bets. 65. And forces the fold. It's an advanced play, which can be costly if it goes wrong, so beginners shouldn't go making a habit of it. Over to the Bahamas now as we take a look at an incredible bluff which occurred when just two players remained to fight it out for the PokerStars Caribbean adventure in 2010. Now this is Top Draw Poker. In this hand from the PokerStars Caribbean adventure, Harrison Gimble pulls off an incredible bluff using all three of the tips we mentioned earlier in the tutorial. Wow, Tyler Ryman flops a straight. Firstly, he's only up against one player. This is when a bluff is more likely to work. His opponent, Tyler Ryman, has made the best possible hand, a straight, until the river card is dealt. At which point, Gimbal finds his reason to bluff. Gimbal decides the size of Ryman's bet represents weakness, and he chooses to execute tip number three. Small one. All in, raise from there. A huge bluff and represent the flush. He represents a hand. In this case, a flush. Ryman is forced to fold. Now that's what I call bluff. An amazing bluff from the PCA there. You see, it's the players that look 15 you've got to watch out for. Over to Vegas now, where the one and only Daniel Negrano analyzes a classy bluff from the big game. A show which pits an amateur, otherwise known as a loose cannon, against a table full of seasoned pros. Any profit the loose cannon makes, they get to take home. the action so far. Pro player David Peat, aka Viffa, called the pre-flop raise of amateur Troy Howard. Both players checked the low flop, and after the ace on the turn, the loose cannon bet $10,000. Viffa made the call with nine high, clearly with a plan, and- All right, stop right there. Oh, sorry, Daniel. Some people think to bluff, you gotta raise when the ace comes. Viffer is calling instead because he figures by calling, well now Troy Howard's gonna think I have an ace for sure. So if he's got queens or jacks or something like that, I can bluff him on the river. Not to mention, a straight's developing too. I mean, it's a small straight, but Viffer plays a lot of hands. You know, the ace, four, five, if, if a two or three comes on the river, you know, maybe he could represent something there like he has a straight. And a three does hit the river. This is a card that Troy can never really bet because he raised before the flop, everyone knows he doesn't have a five in his hand, he doesn't have a deuce in his hand for the straight. 
The only hand he can really have that's all that strong that can, you know, fade a raise is pocket aces. So he should check here. Instead, he bets 10,000 again. Well, that's just like, that's just like bait. You know, you're just throwing it out there for Viffer to just boom, attack it. Ha ha! Viffer's moved all in. No hand, no draw, no nothing. He set this bluff up from minute one. See, now the problem for Troy Howard is he's got to think to himself, okay, what hand can I beat? Viffer checked the flop. He called me when the ace hit. Now he's moving all in on a three. He can't have nine seven, he can't have nothing. There's no hand he can have that I can beat. So pretty much has to fold. So Troy just thinking through the hand now. I don't think there's anything I can beat here. And he throws away the hand and of course Viffer shows it to him too. Nice hand, sir. If you want to watch the show again, recap previous episodes, or join the series at a more advanced level, then go to everythingpoker.com. Time for a break now, but before we go, a test. Poker is a game of selective misinformation, so our question to you is simple. Which of these are telling the truth, and who's bluffing? I once sang the national anthem in front of 3,000 people. As a teenager, I had seven facial piercings. I can eat 15 hot dogs in one sitting. Answer after the break. Okay. So before the break, we asked who was telling the truth. Well, it wasn't Vanessa. Russo has never sung the national anthem in front of 3,000 people. She's got a terrible voice. Sounds like a cat with a sore throat. Chris Moneymaker cannot eat 15 hot dogs in one sitting, allegedly. But David Williams did once have seven facial piercings. Ouchie. And if bluffing is lying, then the continuation bet is Poker's version of the little white lie. What is a continuation bet? Time for your next tutorial. A form of bluffing used frequently at the tables is the continuation bet, or better known as the C bet. It is referred to as a continuation bet as it is a continuation of an aggressive preflop strategy. That is, if a player bets or raises preflop, then they should continue to bet postflop, whether they have made a hand on the flop or not. If players do not see bet, it will become very obvious to their opponents whether they have made a strong hand. If you bet pre-flop and then check after the flop is dealt, it is a sign of weakness. Therefore, players make continuation bets. However, it shouldn't be used every single time. We've outlined four important rules to consider. See bet less often against three or more opponents. The reason behind it is the same as with other bluffs. The more opponents you have, the more likely someone has a good hand to call or raise you with. See bet less often against a tricky opponent. Tricky opponents will look to test you with a re-raise. They may become too expensive to try and hit your draw. See bet more often if your opponent is tight. Tighter opponents are more likely to fold. See bet more often if the board is dry. A dry board means mostly low, unsuited, and unconnected community cards. The continuation bet is a very strong weapon in your arsenal. Therefore, you should use it quite frequently. But don't overdo it. So learn your lesson. If you want to succeed in poker, you're going to need to chance your arm at times. Whether it's an audacious bluff or a strategic piece of aggressive timing, selective misinformation <clears throat> can be the key to success. Everyone makes the occasional pre-flop raise with nothing. Three bets to 110,000. Some do it more than others. 70. Postura 8, revira 70,000. Even if it doesn't work every time. 55. Subió 55,000. Note to begin. When you raise with 8-4 off, you don't want to get called. Only re raises it up to 448,000. I raised under the gun with 8 fours off or something, and he, he's on the small line and he 3 bets me. So I sink forever and I have like, no, I, I didn't sink that much, but I had 33 big lines or something, and I thought it was like a really good re shop spot. So I re shot with 8 four off, and he snapped, called me with ace queen. Oh, he makes the big move, and Conrad calls with ace queen. But I got lucky and I caught my eight on the river. This would be a sad way to go out holding an eight-four offsuit on a pure bluff. Oh, it's the eight of spades! Unbelievable! And that was pretty much it uh, of the tournament. That was the key hand because after that I was like really confident I was going to win. That was the hand. 
I was like, this is it. In 2010, Nacho Barbero made bluffing. Sorry, creative raising a very profitable business. And Barbero wins, you can't believe it. It's back to back Barbero. Capitalizing from his good fortune, he went on to win a quarter of a million dollars at the Latin American Poker Tour in Lima, Peru. Not bad, especially when you consider the fact that he also just won the preceding LAPT event at Punta del Este. It's a 10! It's a 10! You begin to realize that this guy is more than just riding his luck to his 15 minutes of poker fame. To put his two LAPT titles into context, no one had ever won two tour titles before. Nacho did it back to back. When I went to Lima, I wasn't thinking about winning too. I mean, every time you enter a tournament, obviously you're thinking about winning. But it's not like you're like planning on doing it. It's like, it's so tough. I mean, we were counting the odds and it was like really unlikely that it would happen two times in a row. But then when you're getting close and you start just thinking, wow, maybe I win this. It wasn't just the beaches at Punta del Este that had Nacho feeling comfortable. It wasn't just laid back by Lima. Nacho was in the zone. And as many a poker player will testify, you have to play the hot hand. I think the confidence in a poker player is actually the most important thing. Whenever you start feeling that things are going your way and you get the better reads of people, you get the best timing. Everything like just flows. It's not like you are forcing anything. When things aren't going good, I always recommend you just like have to take it easy, don't play a lot. And whenever you you have like the high confidence that you've been winning a lot, just try to go to every possible tournament and enter everything, play online, play live, play 24-7. Doesn't matter, just go with it because you're gonna be doing good. Nacho is a laid back character. It's hard to imagine sometimes the over-aggressive pre-flop razor who sweeps all challenges before him. But the fact is, there's more to Nacho's game than pure aggression. Like everyone should, Barbero varies his play according to the state of the game and his opponent. My style changes a lot. At the beginning of the tournament, I'm really, really tight. And try to spot the, the players that, are, that they have weakness or leaks. And then as the antis and the final table arrives, my style becomes like really, really aggressive. They don't want to mess around with me and <laughs> I'm kind of crazy. Every poker player needs a bit of crazy. Just be careful raising with 8-4 off. The game segment will continue throughout the series. <laughs> I'm kind of crazy. As the best in the business give first person accounts. I'm just not going to be frightened here of some of their biggest moments in poker. I remember it like it was yesterday. So keep watching. <laughs> Okay, here comes the relaxing part of the show. Let's get to know the players a bit more as they focus on today's topic, bluffing. Every January, the Atlantis Resort in the Bahamas plays host to the PokerStars.com Caribbean Adventure. It's all business in the tournament room. And outside, the players get a chance to unwind, chew the fat. And in the beach bar with the waves lapping at the shore, Four friends get together to analyze the nuances of the game and how each other approaches it. Liv Bore, winner of the EPT San Remo title and over one and a half million dollars to go with it. Luca Pagano, who has more EPT caches than any other player. Vanessa Russo, who can boast over three million dollars in live tournament earnings. And the one and only Chris Moneymaker, winner of the 2003 World Series of Poker. Chris made one of the most famous bluffs in poker history on the way to his World Series title when he knocked Sammy Farah off the winning hand with nothing more than King High. Probably one of the most interesting abilities in poker is to be a good bluffer. Chris Moneymaker, tell us something about uh, your biggest move ever I make in your one, poker career. I make career. one bluff and everything I'm a bluffer. Uh, I don't bluff that often. Oh, come on, that's not true. Okay, I mean, that was a bluff. I don't. Now you're bluffing. I don't bluff as near as much. Keep his image going. Come on, don't ruin it. I, I really don't bluff as much as people think I do. I mean, you still have to bluff. I mean, 
You, you do. Uh, I've got a very Look at this face. How could you? How could you not believe this face? How much important is for you to? to, to it's pretty. Learn? It's a pretty decent sized part of my game because um, I become a lot more aware of image. Two years ago, I wasn't really. I mean, I was aware of the fact that I had an image, but I didn't know how to use it. And you know, I remember Daniel Negreanu saying to me, he's like, I wish I could have your, you know, have your body. He said it would be so profitable for me to look like you at the poker table because he understood how to use an image, use a female image. And at the time, I didn't really know how to do that. But now, um, it's something that I've really put a lot of effort into understand and be able to sort of identify who thinks what about the way I play. Because there might be one guy here who goes, oh, that's Liv Marie, she's famous, she's won EPT. He might be scared of me. The next guy might be like, oh, that's Liv Marie. Um, I want to make her fold in every hand. So he might be trying to bluff me. The next guy might be, I don't know, trying to flirt and play soft against me. And then, you know, the next guy might just never have heard and just go, oh, she's a girl, I'm just going to push her around. So it's just important to be able to know what each person thinks of you. I mean, do you ever encounter that? The one thing I know is that when I have other women at the table, that's the hardest. <laughs> like, I definitely, problem, right? definitely don't know what they think of me, and I definitely have no opinions of them. I just basically avoid them in pots. <laughs> like, they're too really hard. To read, I know. really avoid them in pots. Yeah, it's too hard. <laughs> It's honestly, it's women are very tough to play. I do know that. So beyond that, I agree with everything Liv said. It's a definitely an important aspect of the game. You got to get chipped somehow, and you're not going to make hands enough to, you know, not bluff. You just have to pick your right times to bluff. I mean, you know, the right time for me to bluff is <laughs> just about any hand. Any, any hand I get, I guess. The bluff Chris Moneymaker is famous for was against Sammy Farha when heads up for the World Series of Poker main event in 2003. Here's what happened. Moneymaker was holding king seven and Farha had queen nine. Moneymaker raised three times the big blind and Farha called. The flop came nine of spades, two of diamonds, six of spades. Both players checked and saw the turn, which was eight of spades. Farha bet 300,000 with top pair. Moneymaker raised to 800,000 with a flush draw and straight draw and Farha called. The river was the three of hearts. Farha checked and Moneymaker went all in. Farha eventually folded. Great stuff. But any, any hand? Any, any hand? situation? It, it, it depends on the players at the table, yeah, but I mean, I'll bluff more than I probably should. I probably I should uh, mix a little bit uh, my game with your game because probably you're bluffing a little bit too much. I don't bluff that too much. Probably that's because probably my background, you know, I, I really like to take uh, very calculated risk. How many times you cash in the EPT? Uh, 17. That's 17 at the time of filming this. 18 as I do this voiceover. It will most likely be more by the time you watch it. He is the cash machine. Wow. How many times have I? 17. <laughs> One? Yeah, all right. I like your, I like your side of it. Well, I can tell you that uh, among uh, all of us, uh, you're one of those guys that I'd like to catch uh, on a bluff and not you. I mean, uh, that's more obvious that you're bluffing. You see? <laughs> You're a tailbox, Chris. <laughs> I a tailbox. A tailbox is a player that cannot help giving physical information away to their opponents during a hand, making what cards they are holding obvious. I don't think he's ever caught me in a bluff, though. Why, in your opinion, uh, um, all these new players, these new kids that are approaching the tournaments uh, are so aggressive and they like to make such big bluff at the table? I mean, uh, why? What, what's the reason behind that? Machismo, that's why. They Machismo, just, right? They all just sit there, they talk to each other, um, and I know everyone wants to have a cool story to tell their friends. I don't know, I mean, because to an extent, playing very aggressively can be profitable in the right situations. Um, but I think sometimes people take it to the extreme, you know, and you see things where people have it. I think a lot of it comes from the fact they play online, most of these players, and so they're used to winning hands more often. And when you're playing live, the winning hands really come far and few between. And so one way to accelerate the amount of hands that you're winning is to win hands that really aren't yours, at least that you wouldn't deserve as far as the value of your hand. And one of the ways to do that is to bluff. And so it's probably part boredom in the fact that they're not used to going so long without winning a hand. So they get bored, they see an opportunity, and they go for it with a little more gusto than the average live player who I think has cultivated more patience. Well, these kids don't have wives and girlfriends either, so they got to answer to uh, when they get home. How did you bust with King Five? Uh. <laughs>
We've established that there are distinct reasons to bluff and highlighted the situations to exploit. We checked out some fantastic bluffs from the archive and found out just how and why they could be executed. And we've learned that David Williams isn't afraid of needles. To practice all you have learned in the show today, go to PokerStars.com and follow the simple instructions for downloading the free software. Once on the site, join a table and look for those ideal situations to execute the odd bluff. But beware, don't overdo it. Here's what's coming up next time. We look at tournament poker and examine how it works and arm you with the advice you'll need to succeed. We'll hear just what it's like to win the big one and learn all about the tournaments which are available to enter. We should add before we leave that bluffs don't always work. All in. Come on. Ouch. Ugly. We'll see you next time.